Bianca, welcome to my channel. Hi, Lindy. How's it going? It's going very well, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm a little bit great today, but apart from that, still nice here. We never have really winter in Rome, so... Well, neither does Singapore, so it's uh, it's great, but it's, it's always hot here. Anyway, I'm so glad to have you. Uh, today we're going to be answering questions that people have sent in to us, and we have selected 10 questions. So the very first question, we are diving straight into a tricky one. It is uh, from A.M. Os... O Osaki on Instagram and they say you and I are their favorite youtubers. Thank you very much They said they reached a C1 level in Italian a year ago But once they started learning French and focusing more on Italian their Italian got really bad and they started mixing languages So the question is how do you avoid mixing similar languages? Um, Luca, let's start with you. What's what's your advice for this person? This is a common problem for those who are learning, especially languages that are similar, but not only. This reminds me of a person who had spent a lot of time in Spain. She had learned Spanish. She could speak Spanish fluently, and then she moved to Italy. And every time, and after some time, she focused totally on, on Italian. And after some time, she could not speak uh, in Spanish anymore. There is this uh, mechanism in our brain of storage. You know, we, we store information, words and sentences in our long-term memory. But there's also a mechanism of retrieval. So basically when we speak, we go and fetch pieces of information to form sentences in the language. Now what happens is that when you speak a language fluently, uh, you, form, you, you have stored a lot of information, but when you don't speak it anymore and you start learning another one, this, this retrieval mechanism is very strong for the language you're currently focusing on and it becomes weaker and weaker with the language that you're not using because you know, since you're not using it, you're signaling to your brain that is not important anymore. So my piece of advice, um, it, first of all, I wanted to say this is totally normal uh, because of the way our brain works. And my piece of advice is if you're focusing on one language now, because that's the main focus, and I think in your case was French, spend the bulk of your time learning that. Maybe if you have one hour, spend 45 minutes learning French, but also make sure that you spend some 15 minutes learning, uh, going back to the, the other language that you, you speak fluently, in this case Italian, you're doing something. Since you, ha since you have a, a C1, it doesn't cost too much to watch a TV series for 20 minutes, listen to something so that you're signaling to your brain that that language is still important. So uh, in a nutshell, do both every day, focus the bulk of your time on the language you're currently learning and building because it's important and then make sure that you learn also. You go back to the other language and you practice it a little bit, telling your brain that that is important. I don't know how you do things, Lindy, in this regard, I'm curious, but this is what I normally do, um, not to confuse languages. And this is what is happening in your brain. It's totally normal and it's a solvable problem. Absolutely, yeah. I agree that when um, languages are quite similar, it's much easier to confuse them. But even if the languages are not mutually intelligible, I found myself confusing languages that are both new to me. So I found that I was mixing Indonesian and Vietnamese, even though these languages don't have anything in common. So I realized maybe my solution is to only learn a new language once you've reached a certain level in another one. And that way you can do language stacking. So that's what I did with Japanese is I learned Korean to an upper intermediate level. I used Korean as the language of instruction for Japanese. But this is risky. So I want I want to know your opinion on this, Luca. When a language like Korean and Japanese are very, very similar in, in grammar and in structure and vocabulary. There are people who recommend and say you should use Korean as a language of instruction to learn Japanese and language stack once you've reached a certain level. But there are other people who say be careful because they're too similar, so you shouldn't learn them. I guess you can say the same for, for Spanish and French. What What is your thinking? Would you learn French to an advanced level and use it as a language of instruction for Spanish? As I always say, whatever floats your boat. I think you can test it, you can you can you can try it, and then you can see if it works. In my personal case, I don't don't triangulate, meaning I do not use a what is called an L2 to learn an L3. So I do not use a language I know well to learn another language. I use um, the bidirectional translation method. So I always uh, make sure that I use one language that I know well in order to understand and dissect the patterns of another language. But normally it's either Italian or English languages that I know quite well. 
But um, if you want to do it, do it, but then check if things are going well or not. I always say it depends on the individual. So I would not, I would not say that you do not have to do this by all means. For some languages, sometimes you do not have the version in English. So all you need to, all you can do is actually use the resource they offer in French. So you have the bilingual version in French and in the target language you want to learn. Even in that case, when I um, translate, when I use my translation technique, I use Italian as a language uh, that, you know, I write my translations in Italian of the text to then translate back, but I use Italian uh, because it's my native language. And I have a personal attachment to, um, personal emotional attachment to my own native language. Uh, go for it, but keep in mind that this strategy could backfire. And if, if it does backfire, I would say just like, take a moment, think, and then maybe you can go back and using a language you know well, or even better your native language i i think people are often looking for the the number one best way to learn a language and it sounds so cliche to say it's really up to you as a learner to figure out what you like so it's very obvious here that both luca and i i have completely different methods you do not learn you do not use an l2 to learn an l3 i don't mind doing that it it doesn't mean um, your method is better or mine is be better it's just what we prefer right so i prefer to keep Korean and life. And because Korean is so similar to Japanese, it's easier for me to think quickly because the grammar structure is similar. But I wouldn't use a more beginner language to learn another language because my vocabulary would be very limited. So it's very hard to answer this question about how do you not mix languages because it is inevitable. And I think it's just part of the language learning process and um, just give yourself a lot of time and um, figure out what works for you. If, if learning a language through another language is not working for you, maybe pause. And I like what you said at the beginning of your answer is to dedicate uh, a big amount of time for your target language and then use the rest of the time kind of for maintenance in your other languages. And that is the approach that I'm gonna take for, for 2021 is I will choose two target languages um, per three months as a quarter. So I will focus on Tagalog and Hungarian and dedicate the majority of my time for that. And all the other languages, I will just use a little bit as maintenance time. So as you can see, both Luca and I have quite a few different methods and it's up to you to explore those methods and see what works for you. Thank you for your insight, Luca. So I'm gonna go on to the next question. So this one is from K-N-A-T-U underscore R on Instagram. Have you ever felt that your way of thinking has changed because of all the languages you use to process different information? So essentially, have languages changed the way you think? I'm just going to give a very quick reply. Definitely yes. It relates to two things for me, culture and mindset of the target country, the target language, as well as vocabulary. There are some things that you can express in one language and the words don't exist in another language. So it, it kind of shapes your way of thinking as well as just generally culture, the way people think, what is taboo to them, what is not, what is um, beautiful or exciting to them might be different for someone else. And it just broadens your worldview a lot. Uh, I would say, I always say that language learning shaped the way I see the world in, in a lot of ways. I really like using this metaphor of the prism that we're like a prism hit by light. I think that language learning does not change our personalities, but it expands the amount of colors of our personalities, different shapes and facets of our personality. So in that regard, I think that learning more languages hasn't changed the core of the person I am, but shows uh, allows me to show the different colors, right? Of the way I would be if I um, were born in a given country, like the American Luca, the French Luca, uh, the Spanish Luca, et cetera, et cetera. Not only has language learning changed the way you see the world, and as you were saying, uh, you see a culture, another culture in a different way, you're more open, you see the nuances that you didn't see before, because let's face it, everyone thinks that their own culture, before you learn about other cultures, you always think that uh, everything revolves around yours. Before I started venturing to this beautiful world of languages, I thought that, the whole world used to eat is supposed to eat pasta twice a day. <laughs> Just, to, it, I know it's very cliche, but that's exactly that's really what I thought because in my family that's what. Uh, that's why, yeah. you know, this is just one of the many examples. Language learning has been a process that has, and I'm really thankful that I have been able to undertake this process, has helped me understand much better 
the person I am. It makes me understand much better uh, the place I have in the world as a citizen, as an Italian, as a person. Back in the day, I had some sort of fixed mindset. Well, now I have a growth mindset. It's Everything is possible because the brain is plastic. So learning so many languages has broken all the biases and all the... Uh, you know, the false uh, ideas I had about learning, about the world, and about myself. Third, language learning has changed the way I think in the sense that I obviously can have different thoughts when I speak a different language. All the people I have come into contact with, all the experiences I had within that language, fire up in my brain. So when I speak English, when I speak Sp Spanish, when I speak French, I do not, my thought patterns are not exactly the same. I am the same person, but what happens in my brain is that these people who have, you know, I have come into contact with, I had conversations with, kind of all, all every single experience is, uh, fires up in my brain. That's, and the last thing I wanted to say is that it hasn't, it has made me um, a faster thinking uh, thinker in the sense that now I have more, I connect the dots more, but it that hasn't made me, um, faster in other uh, areas of life because they think that the areas in your brain are separated to also to break the, t the 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 prejudice that if you learn more languages then your uh, your memory gets better it does get better for learning words it doesn't get better for learning numbers i recently ran a test of remembering some 10 words in Basque, the, the result was pretty average. To go to the point, go straight to the point, language learning is an amazing experience that changes the way you think, uh, the way you process information, and the way you see the world and yourself. So as a reflection uh, of that, your mindset uh, and your experiences is completely different. You understand that the world is literally at your feet if you put your mind to it. Yeah. Um, and again, what you were saying about uh, kind of the experiences that fire up for me, it's also the experiences and people I meet that might uh, shape the way I think in a certain way. So that's maybe a, a indirect effect of how learning a language and the people you meet through it will shape it because we are a result of um, our culture and the language we speak and the people we are surrounded by, they affect the way we think about things. So kind of as a sub result of that because of who we interact with what we expose ourselves to whether it be media or music that might kind of shift how we perceive things as well and i was also watching a talk at women in language this year and they were talking about journaling in another language and how that kind of reveals different pieces of you because you're using a different lens different set of vocabulary to write and work through things. So if I have a very limited vocabulary in Hungarian, for instance, and I'm journaling about a certain situation, I am forced to think in a different way because I cannot express everything I would be able to say in English when I'm using another language. So I'm pushing my creativity and limits to try and think using a different like lens, uh, if that makes sense. I, it just reminded me that I've been journaling for the last 30 years. Um, I started journaling when I was, I think, 12, and I never stopped every single day. I used to journal in English and in French when I was 15. That forced me to think in a different way, and that what you said just reminded me of that. And, and journaling to this day has been extremely beneficial, especially you know, across different languages, because as you said, when you are using another language, you're exploring different thought patterns and different possibilities within your mind that you were not conscious of. Absolutely. Agreed. Uh, okay, question number four uh is what is the hardest language to learn and why and then a sub question is which language has personally benefited you the most and why i'm curious to know your answer but without having us influence each other's answer you can hold on to yours and i will say that i don't think you can say there is one language that is necessarily the hardest but it depends on your native language it depends on the languages you have learned I'm assuming this person might be asking what is the hardest language to us to learn, not in the whole world, because people will argue and say it's Chinese or it's Hungarian or it's Arabic. For me personally, it is uh, Thai because it's tonal and the writing system is quite complex and uh, Hungarian because of the grammar. So I'm curious to know what is the hardest language that you have tried to learn, Luca? To answer your question, as you as you said, pointing out, there is no hardest language in the world because it depends on you. I think it depends on your na on, on one's native language first. For me personally, um, Japanese. I also made a, a YouTube video about it, saying that the reason why it was so difficult is because Japanese was the first language that was kind of SOV, so it has a 
difference in tactical structure. You don't say, I ate an apple. You say, I, an apple, ate, and it gets worse the longer the sentence. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so it was really difficult to learn. It's, it is difficult to learn. I think it's very hard for Westerners also because it's a kind of situational language where it's really important to be in the environment. There are some things that you understand when you either live in Japan or you come into contact with Japanese people. Unfortunately, I just had... I, I had just one tutor. She was fantastic. She, she is still fantastic. But when I used to talk to her, the context was limited. The internet is, is fantastic. But the reality is that real life still uh, makes a difference when you experience, when you have experiences in real life. So for me, not having a lot of con contact with uh, the Japanese reality, because I've never been to Asia before, and I really like to, um, to visit Asia in general, China, Japan. I think that for me, the most, the most difficult part was on the one hand, the different syntax. And on the other hand, what really makes a difference in my learning process is actually not the beginning. It's not when I start learning and hitting the books. It's everything that happens once I've reached a certain level and I can use the language in the environment. Japanese is one language where you might want to have, might want to use translation with a little bit of caution. Otherwise, you run the risk of translating everything literally. And you know that if you want to say a long sentence, then if you start thinking, okay, uh, these elements, then I have to put them all in the different order. It, it just burdens your uh, short-term memory and you are not able to speak. That would made Japanese. And one last thing I wanted to say, another language that was really difficult for me was Romanian. Why? You might say Romanian, but what do you mean? Romanian is very similar to Italian. It's because I did not... Um, create, I did not look for native speakers. I, can, I did not, I was not looking forward to using the language. I was just learning a language in a vacuum. So my motivation was very low. And, and when people say, what's the most difficult language is also one you don't want to learn because you're not motivated enough. Everything starts with the why. I can see a lot of what you're saying is related to uh, exposure, resources, and motivation. And I think you and I had very different experiences with learning Japanese. For me, it was one of the easier languages because it was so similar in syntax and vocabulary to Korean. So it was easy. My brain wasn't like, why is it SOV? Um, I, could, I could directly relate it back and be like, oh, this grammar particle is exactly the same as that. I get it. Uh, snapped it really quickly. Um, and also, I did have the, the opportunity to travel to Japan twice a year over the span of four years. So both you and I had very different uh, experiences with the language. It's the same language, the same grammar and rules, but because we had different experiences, I interpret it as easier to learn and you interpret it as harder, but neither of our experiences relate to the language itself. Like this word is hard to pronounce or this kanji is hard to write. It's really the, the um, resources and the people. But I like what you said about motivation. Absolutely. I, I, I feel um, Burmese was quite tricky for me because my motivation wasn't deeply rooted and deeply grounded. I have a few Burmese colleagues. Um, I like the writing system and that was really it. And, and that doesn't um, carry through for a very long time. What if my colleague leaves the company and I can't find any more good music? Like there's no really deep rooted motivation for me to continue learning. And that also makes it um, tricky as well, though it doesn't really uh, regard to the grammar of the language itself. Um, then this person's next question is, which language has personally benefited you the most and why? I would say that there's not one language that has not benefited me. So every language has benefited me. And I always say that it's worth learning a language even poorly, as uh, famed uh, Lom Kato, Hungarian polygon, used to say. But uh, for the sake of brevity and simplicity, I would say that the languages that um, I, I say I reap the most benefits from are, uh, without a doubt, English and French. English because... It's ubiquitous and I use it all the time. Learning English is a must. You, you just can't, uh, can't do without it. Um, and on the other side, French. I lived in, in France. My ex-girlfriend was uh, French and I lived another reality. I learned, I benefited enormously from speaking French when I first, uh, when I met um, my ex-girlfriend, when I was in Prague, the fact that I could speak French, she, they, she was with other uh, two other girls. And she said, oh, oh, you speak French. So it opens opportunities, but then but, you know, opens a lot of opportunities in terms of romance. But then the fact that I could speak French fluently before I moved to France and I lived there for three years really made a difference uh, in the way I was living, the way people were treating me. Yeah, beautiful answer. Thanks. I like that you related back to 
romance as well because uh, sometimes that is a legit reason to learn a language. Just saying. <laughs> So which language has personally benefited me the most? I would say it's Korean because I learned it the most and because uh, I learned Korean for the longest time. So within the span of 10 or 12 years, it means there are more opportunities than I would have had with a language I learned shorter. So I've been on Korean TV or been in a Korean magazine, traveled to the country. I guess you can count that as benefiting you um, because those are experiences I've had over the span of a decade plus. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I like the writing system. It's been easier for me to take notes um, because Korean is very quick and easy to write. So whenever I'm taking notes during meetings, it's also like a little shorthand for me. So those are two ways that I believe Korean has been most beneficial to my life. Okay, the next question is from Derek on Twitter. And he says, his stumbling block is always the same in every language, turning his reading, writing, and speaking vocab and grammar into oral comprehension. So essentially listening is very tricky. He knows all the words, but he can't extract the meaning of the full sentence. I'm going to let you lead with your answer. How do you know the meaning of a full sentence when you have all the words, but you just can't piece it together during listening? The easy solution in your case is just to listen and read at the same time. Let, let me explain what I mean. When I ask my students, for example, what are your skills? And they tell me, well, I, I, I can read well, but I can't understand when I, when I listen to, or I can speak poorly. So some people develop some skills more than others. And the reason why this happens is because they do some things less than they do others. In your case, if you read a lot and if you speak a lot, or you try to speak yourself, for example, but you do not listen, uh, well, then you will have some gaps in listening comprehension. So you might be wondering, okay, Luca, but if I listen a lot and I don't understand, well, I would say just take a step back and the easiest way to build your listening comprehension is to expose yourself to, con to content you can understand. To listen to stuff you can also read because if you read stuff and you listen to it at the same time, not only are you focusing better because you're using two different channels, but on top of that, you're understanding every single thing that you can read and listen to because imagine you have a text, right? That you've never seen before. Then you can, let's say, copy and paste it into Google Translate or any other uh, translator. Then you understand the, the meaning of the text. You, and after you understand it, if you listen and read at the same time, you will be able to actually tell the, the meaning of the words and the flow, uh, the sound flow, and you can read. I would take a step back and start massively reading and listening at the same time for three, six months. And then little by little, you can venture into the pure listening um, ground. This is what I've been doing for years and years. When I start learning a language, I always make sure that uh, I listen and read at the same time so I can build my uh, understanding. And on top of that, I can, you know, I figure out the, the phonetic patterns by repeatedly listening. And then after three to six months, you know, the reading and listening, they start uh, branching out. Either I read or I listen to a language. It normally happens after six or nine months, but I never just, I, I do listen to a language also at the beginning, but only after I understood it. I made sure they understood it because some people claim that you can just listen in the background, you're gonna learn. This could happen if your language is very similar to yours. I still remember there was a guy on YouTube who made this, uh, who ran this very interesting experiment. He spent 10,000 hours watching Chinese TV, even with subtitles, without knowing a word. After 10,000 hours of watching TV, he could not speak, he could barely understand. It goes to show that, you know, you can spend a lot of time, but if you do not build your language skills through listening, uh, through comprehensible and interesting inputs, ain't gonna happen, as they say. I agree. I, I feel that sometimes when I'm listening to a podcast in another language and it's just a little bit above my level, I, I tend to trail, my thoughts tend to trail off and I might know enough words to sort of piece it together, but because it's above my level, it's not comprehensible input, I'm struggling to stay focused and I lose motivation because I'm like, this is hard, I'm never going to learn. But when I have a script, like a transcript with me, whether it is someone's YouTube channel that they have like subtitles for, or if it's a like an app, I like to use the, the, the Ling app because there's audio and uh, text at the same time in a conversation format. When it is fun and interesting content to you that you can see and read, 
uh, it's a lot easier. So uh, completely agree with everything you said, Luca. Thank you. The next question we have is from Norman. Now he is 66 years old, he says, and he says he thinks that handwriting vocabulary repeatedly works to fix it in a long-term memory. He wonders if it works as well for younger people who have grown up with keyboard use. He's had many lectures where he had to write notes physically when he was in school. Now, I don't know how young I am anymore because I grew up with like both key, like both laptops and uh, paper in school, a mix of both. Personally, for myself, I don't like to type my notes. I feel like muscle memory is very important, especially for languages that have a different writing system, especially even more for kanji or hanzi or, or hanza, uh, Korean, Chinese, and Japanese, where you are using Chinese characters, which you need to know the specific order for. I'm not going to learn that if I'm just typing it. And there is a big discrepancy between my ability to type in Chinese and my ability to handwrite. Because when I'm typing, I'm using pinyin, so I'm sounding out the words, and then my keyboard will say, this is the character you want, and I'm like, oh yeah, I recognize that one, it's that. Whereas when I'm writing, I'm like, oh gosh, I forgot how to, how to write the stroke order of this, and um, I'd be able to recognize it, but I wouldn't be able to write it on demand. It depends what you want to solidify in your long-term memory. If you want to be able to know how to write the character or write the word, the vocabulary word, off the bat, or if you just want to be able to recognize it. I prefer to handwrite my vocabulary. I feel like I'm engaging more with my content. I'm more awake. There have been studies done. Maybe you, Luca, know the numbers and the facts. I don't, but I know that according to research, you remember something more when you write it down instead of just listening to it. What do you think? Right on the money, Lindy, right on the money. I, I, I agree 100% of with everything you said. And um, the internet gives us possibilities and uh, gives us breath, breath, but writing a, a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper, they give us depth. And um, before, with Greek and Hungarian, I used to have, and I still do to this day, have conversations with my tutors, and then my tutors type all my mistakes or new words into a Google Doc. What I used to do is to listen to the recording again and looking at the Google Doc, and typing and you know adding a few things here and there and then, then after some time I figure out this is not working this is not sticking to my memory I'm there's always a barrier between us and a screen what happens behind a screen and then I started writing more and more and now I just love it just before this interview I was just writing things down in Greek I the there are so many benefits to writing your motor skills your motor memory the fact that you're using your hand there's hundreds and hundreds of studies pointing to the fact that handwriting is much more beneficial i saw it for myself from my experience and my language learning has skyrocketed from not only my language learning but my vocabulary acquisition you don't have to be categorical and say oh, either i use the computer or use I use paper i would say use both Use the internet to create uh, interesting stuff that you can download, print the stuff if you can. When you listen and read, for example, I always make sure that I am looking at a piece of paper while listening because my I'm much more focused. But on top of that, if you use a simple pencil, I always have it anywhere I go, a post-it or everything I can jot down. That is, This is going to make a difference. When you're writing down words, jotting down words, one thing that has really made a difference is to jot down words in small chunks phrase so it's a piece yeah. of, of uh, let's say it's a piece of a sentence and that has uh, really helped me uh, realize the importance of writing chunking and getting out of there you know extracting the pieces of information that are important for you in terms of communication if you can handwrite um, as much as you can, but also type. And you were saying, um, Lindy, about you were talking about typing in general. When it comes to Chinese and or Japanese, especially Chinese, I type because I like typing. It's more difficult for me to handwrite because I it's something I chose not to focus too much energy on. But by typing, I can recognize the characters. But if you want to handwrite, then you can type and write at the same time because both have benefits. So the next question is from Ian on Twitter. He's asking if we have any methods that we use that were not effective and uh, how we changed our course. Uh, I guess quick answer from my side is uh, flashcards and single words. I used to make flashcards of just individual words and this kind of relates back to your point about um, 
putting words in little little phrases, little chunks. Um, so chunking really changed my language learning life. Instead of just putting the word like car or uh, cake or plate on a flashcard, I would make a mini phrase. So like, I wash the plate or I drive the car, he eats the cake. And by adding smaller phrases instead of words out of context, that really helped. So something that just was never effective for me was memorizing single words because my brain is not making a connection. Why do I need to know the word car? I want to know how to say I drive a car. Um, and flashcards, I just found them uh, very time consuming to make because I was making them on paper. It was wasteful, uh, you know, wasting paper. Once you've gone through the flashcard deck, what do you do? So I switched to digital flashcards but I don't enjoy using a screen. So now I don't necessarily use digital flashcards a lot. I prefer to write um, half or full sentences, phrases or sentences in a notebook. Fantastic. As far as I'm concerned, there's two things I would change if I could go back in time. One for Japanese and one for languages which are very similar. So for Japanese, or for specifically for languages that have a different syntax, such as uh, Japanese or Turkish or Korean, what I would do is I would avoid using translation and I would stick to, let's say, developing the language from small, very small chunks and then build these chunks. So just let me give you an example. A lot of people have a hard time speaking languages that have a different syntax. Japanese have a hard time speaking English. Native English speakers have a hard time at the beginning speaking Korean or, in or, 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 or Japanese or other languages. And the reason why this happens is, is that fundamentally they're trying to think, um, they're trying to form sentences that are too complex. So their brain goes like, whoo, just wait a second, this is too complex. And you start uh, translating everything into through, you got, you got to start filtering everything through a native language. So if I could go back uh, in time, I would approach Japanese in a different way. I would not use translation at the beginning, but I would focus on very short sentences where I can say simple things, the mental burden is relatively low, and then I can build upon that. And the second thing that I would change is, um, maybe I would not change, but I would do differently from now on, to start speaking languages that are very similar from almost from the very beginning. I realized when I was learning Portuguese, having already Spanish under my belt, I could have spoken from the very beginning. It could have, like Romanian, Catalan, if I go back to Romanian, and I will, I will not, for the life of me, grab a text and read and translate. I would just like jump in a conversation, jot down notes, you're gonna learn on the fly. Different languages have different uh, approaches, but these are the two things that I would definitely change. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. We have another question from Andre on Twitter. Uh, when did you guys first hear about each other and first meet? So I'm not sure if people know that Luca and I have actually never met in person, even though we've been to kind of similar language events at different times, we've actually never met in person. Uh, where did we first hear of each other, Luca? Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think I started um, watching your videos at the beginning of 2019 or something like that. I can't really pinpoint a time, but I remember that, um, you know, your YouTube videos were making the rounds, were very popular. And then I said, oh, oh, let, me, let me check because you were popping out <laughs> on, the, on the right column. And I, I was struck by the quality of the videos and the things you were saying. So I really liked the content. I said, oh, uh, this, this, is, this is fantastic. And so I think it's been two years, two and a half years. Really, I got to tell you the truth. I don't remember, but it's been at least two years. Um, and and uh, that's how I have heard about you. And then I know that you were you participated in the Polyga Conference, for example, in Japan. I could not participate, unfortunately. Hopefully, we're going to meet um, sooner or later. You know, I know that you live on the other side of the world, but the world is actually smaller than, than we think. And then, you know, when this pandemic is over, I can't wait to participate in other, you know, events and, and meet you and other uh, language, uh, fantastic and enthusiastic language learners. I think uh, I've known about you longer than you've known about me. I think I was in probably my last year of high school, if not my first or second year of university. So maybe 2013-ish, I saw your videos on YouTube. So you were one of the first like OG YouTube polyglots who I watched and probably part of the inspiration for me to start my own channel. So I guess I met you through YouTube. I don't think we actually had communication before 2020. I, I don't think we have. I, 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 think, no. I think either you sent me a message or I think I sent you a message. I think I sent you an email 
if I'm not wrong, but that was like a few months ago. And then that's, yeah. right, that's how we started. I, actually, I, it's weird because I've always, you know, liked your videos. And, you know, since I, since I started watching them, I, I thought they were fantastic. And I, but recently, uh, you know, I, I tend to reach out more, less to people. Life is getting very hectic and I spend a lot of time on the internet giving lessons, etc. And then, you know, you don't want to add, uh, you know, yeah. more time. But on the other hand, you know that if you talk to this person, you're like, oh, wow, this person is really interesting. I could talk for her. I'm pretty sure I could talk for her for hours. I think I told you yeah. that if we met, we could speak for hours because, um, you know, you and other languagers, we have so much to talk about. It, it, it being part of a community, sometimes um, I receive some messages from, especially from Americans, this is a surprising thing, saying, oh, this is a monolingual country and people do not understand my passion for languages. So finally, I found a community where people understand me, where I can share, you know, my uh, my quirks, my language quirks. We, we spoke for hours, not just about language learning, about anything, about, I, I think that the community has the, what keeps us, glues us together is not just the love of language learning, it's everything that comes with it. It's being open, it's wanting to understand others, it's, it's just, you can feel the amazing atmosphere that you breathe in these events. And that's the reason why when people ask me, should I be a, a should I, am I supposed to be a polygot to participate? And I always say, you do not have to be a polygot, you just, just come and you will see. And when I go to these events, it's a transformational event. You go, you, you, you just go back home with stars in your eyes and thinking, oh, I want to do, I want to learn this language and this language and this language. Apart from the linguistic knowledge that, um, you know, speakers and participants are going to, uh, to give you, it's just the experience in and of itself that is, uh, you know, a game changer, I would say. Uh, the next question we have is from Aiden on Twitter. Uh, is it important to focus on a specific accent when learning a language? I'm assuming Aiden is referring to languages that have uh, maybe English has the American, British, Australian, South Korean accent, and then we have uh, Spanish, which has multiple accents. I think that accents are important because they define the identity that you're going to be building in the language you want to you want to speak. So I would say that if you're learning a language like such as Spanish or uh, or French or English, so global languages that have multiple uh, different accents, I would say just I would go for one accent. I would be consistent for a couple of years, listening and getting exposed to that specific accent, then you can venture out and you can listen to other accents without that um, changing um, the, the accent that you have acquired. It was really easy for me to learn Spanish, Castilian Spanish, Spanish from Spain, because all the courses I, I could get my hands on were in Spanish from Spain. But if you want to learn, say, Argentinian Spanish, I'm not sure there are a lot of courses in Argentinian Spanish. I might be wrong or in other uh, for example, parts of, of South America. And I know that a lot of people who learned Argentinian Spanish or Mexican Spanish, they learned it because they were living in the country or they were having uh, massive exposure to speakers of that specific accent. I would definitely recommend you learn one specific accent and then you can get exposure to all the accents after one year or two years because otherwise it can get a little bit confusing. I think also vocabulary will differ between accent to accent. So regional, even though it's the same global language like Spanish, the way uh, Mexicans might refer to a certain word is very different from how uh, Spain Spanish speakers would refer to it. Even just the basic words like juice or car are quite different. So if you choose one, you're not going to be mixing and sounding like half Spanish, half Mexican. So uh, in that regard, I do think it's important to choose one. The very last question we have from John Guzman on Twitter is, oh, he's got multiple questions. Why is it so hard to speak compared to listening and reading? And if it, it would be interesting if you guys could use some of the languages you already speak, not in English. How do you choose the languages you learn? Alors, en français, Lucas. Uh, how do you choose languages you learn? Choose your languages and spend speaking with difficult... How do you choose? En français, euh, moi je dirais que c'est les langues qui me choisissent et, et pas le contraire, c'est-à-dire qu'on a l'impression tout le temps que nous on choisit les langues, les langues mais en général ça n'était pas mon expérience. Dans mon expérience par exemple, j'ai été choisi par le hongrois parce que j'étais en Hongrie et je suis tombé amoureux du pays et de la langue. C'est comme une sirène qui m'appelait. Euh, donc pour moi, euh, je pense que c'est important de... Par exemple, je conseille toujours si, si tu veux vraiment apprendre une langue, si tu vas, si tu travailles un peu 
si tu voyages un peu dans le pays, tu vas, euh, tu vas passer un peu de temps avec des, euh, des natifs, tu auras euh, envie et, et la motivation pour apprendre une autre langue. Donc pour moi, c'est important. Comme, comme je, je dis toujours, les, les langues, c'est comme, comme des filles. C'est eux qui choisissent. C'est elles qui choisissent, c'est pas moi. Ok, ok, je comprends. Ouais, pour moi, il y a plusieurs, plusieurs raisons euh, pour, pourquoi je choisis une, une langue. Euh, en fait, c'est la musique. Euh, le vietnamien et l'hongrois, je, je les choisis euh, seulement pour la musique. J'adore la musique euh, vietnamienne. Et quand j'ai écouté l'hongrois pour la première fois, j'ai pensé « Oh, cette langue, c'est trop étrange et j'aimerais bien... Euh, » euh, savoir comment dire des mots en anglais et euh, alors pour ça c'était seulement la musique pour les deux l'anglais et le vietnamien le coréen j'ai j'ai beaucoup d'amis euh, coréens euh, en général pour l'hongrois c'était comme 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 toi enfin je j'ai écouté j'ai j'ai entendu la langue quand j'étais en Hongrie j'ai bien aimé le pays en général et les gens et euh, le même la même chose c'était pour le, le polonais par exemple j'étais en Pologne je suis tombé amoureux de de la langue et des et des gens de, de la culture. Je ne m'assois pas et je pense, c'est quoi la, la prochaine langue que je, je vais apprendre C'est juste la vie qui me suggère les langues que je, que je vais apprendre. Donc, euh, c'est comme ça que ça marche, après moi au moins. Ouais, ouais, je comprends. Euh, alors, l'autre question, c'est uh, Why is it so hard to speak compared to listening and reading Would you like to answer this question in Dutch And I will try with Afrikaans, and we see how we manage with Dutch and Afrikaans. What do you think? That's that's fine. It's gonna be fun. I haven't spoken uh, I haven't spoken Dutch in a long time, but we can. I think you can manage. Um, okay, I, I I don't speak Dutch, so we'll see if I can manage with Afrikaans and Dutch. So why is it so hard to speak compared to listening and reading? Hoekom is het zo moeilijk om te praat wanneer het makkelijk is om te luisteren en te lezen? Wat denk jij? Ik denk het is een, een kwestie van oefening. Ik denk dat als je veel luistert, bijvoorbeeld, ben je goed aan het luisteren, maar je moet eigenlijk spreken. Ik kan wel een, een, een taal uh, tegen een taal luisteren, aan de taal luisteren de hele tijd, maar um, je moet de, 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 de taal eigenlijk oefenen en spreken om je wilt de, die taal spreken. Dat is de... Uh, de reden waarom een taal te spreken... Een taal te spreken is niet moeilijk. Het probleem, het, het probleem is eigenlijk... Je moet de taal oefenen. Je moet de taal spreken. Want uh, anders zal het heel, uh, heel moeilijk zijn... Om met de anderen te communiceren. Uh, bijvoorbeeld mijn studenten te zeggen de hele tijd... Ik kan eigenlijk de taal niet spreken. Ik luister naar, het, naar de taal de hele tijd. Ik kan wel um, schrijven of, of lezen. Maar je moet de taal, je moet de taal oefenen. Bijvoorbeeld nu in, in hierdie jaar 2020, ons allemaal sit by die huis en ons luister en ons skryf en ons sms, ons maat heel tyd, maar het is nie eindelijk tyd vir ons om te sit en te praat nie of uit te gaan, allemaal is moeg om Zoom te gebruik. Maar ja, ek stem saam, dit is een skill basis wat jy moet oefen, so hoe meer jy praat, hoe makkelijker is dit. En ek dink dit is ook ook om dit goeie advies is om te begin praat, um, sodra jy kan, sodra jy gemakkelijk voel om in die taal te praat, Probeer, al is het net een paar sinniekies. Um, want ek denk, mense is ook bang om te praat. Jy, jy denk, die ander persoon gaan vir jou lach. Het is heel gaaf uh, naar jou t, in, het, uh, in het Afrikaans te luisteren. Ik kan wel eigenlijk begrijpen, ik kan snappen wat je zegt. En uh, de, 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 die talen, de lijken op elkaar. Uh, ik begrijp, dat het is eigenlijk normaal dat Nederlands en, 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 en Afrikaans lijken op elkaar... Uh, maar het is echt interessant. Ik, ik vind, we kunnen eigenlijk communiceren in... Uh, in, uh, in <laughs> ik, ik kan eigenlijk spreken in Nederlands spreken. En ik kan wel in Afrikaans spreken. We kunnen communiceren en, en kletsen. Het is heel interessant. En uh, Nederlands en Duits... Mm, ik weet niet. Duitsers kunnen niet Nederlands begrijpen. Tenminste, dat is wat ze ja. zeggen. Maar uh, Nederlanders kunnen Duitsers begrijpen. Want uh, misschien leren ze... Uh, het Duits uh, op de school. Ik weet het niet, maar het is heel interessant. Ja, ja. Ik denk, mensen zeggen dat het is makkelijker voor Afrikaanse mensen om Hollands te verstaan of Nederlands te verstaan, als wat het is voor Hollanders om Afrikaanse mensen ja. te verstaan. Ik weet niet. En voor Duits ook, als iemand Duits praat, kan ik soort van verstaan wat hulle sê, maar ik zal niet kan terugpraat nie. Het, het, hetzelfde uh, 
Portugees en, en, en Spaans. Spanen hebben, hebben problemen het Portugees van Portugal te begrijpen. Maar Portugezen kunnen eigenlijk Spaans zonder problemen begrijpen. Dus alles is zeer interessant. Oh ja, cool. Wel, dit is onze laatste vraag. Dat was onze laatste vraag. En we hebben been talking for over an hour. So I, I really appreciate your time, Luca. Thank you for sharing your language learning wisdom. And it was really great. Is there, is there anything else you want to say as we finish up? Um, thank you, Lindy, for inviting me. I just wanted to say keep rocking because uh, you're inspiring people around the world. And uh, maybe one day we should do a, you know, a, a multi-language uh, chat to uh, hopefully inspire people even more. Yeah, thank you so much. It was it was great talking to you.